Welcome back to this very special edition of the Rosenberg Report as I sit down with Amir Tibon, a highly respected Israeli journalist, telling me how peaceful and beautiful was the kibbutz that he and his young family lived in right on the Gaza border on October 6th and how that paradise was plunged into hell, in his words, in the early morning hours of October 7th. October 6th, a regular Friday, we wake up in Kibbutz Nachaloz, one of the most beautiful places in the country. A small, tight-knit community, 500 people living on the border with Gaza. You know, green lawns, trees everywhere, little alleyways, shaded, cool, nice, a playground, a little kibbutz store where you, you know, we take our girls after... Gan Eden, uh, yeah. the Garden of Eden. In a Mamash, sense. paradise on the verge of hell. You're married, you've got two little girls. Little, uh, how, how old are they? Galia, our oldest, is three and a half years old, and Carmel, our youngest, is one and a half years wow, old. Wow, wow, wow. Okay. And they are growing up on this beautiful kibbutz. Mm. This is their world. Yeah. Um, and in that evening, Friday evening, there is a rehearsal at the pool of the kibbutz because the next day, on Saturday, October 7, we are supposed to celebrate 70 years to the foundation of kibbutz Nachal Oz. Wow. Half the kibbutz is in this general rehearsal. My girls go on the stage. There's a dance of the kids ahead of the... They're going to do it tomorrow on the big stage with everyone. Now they're rehearsing. Life is great, Joel. Mm -hmm. The sky is blue. You know, we go to sleep. We're very excited about the next day with this party, with everybody coming. Before we go to sleep, I tell Miri, my wife, she's a social worker. You know, how lucky are we to live on this kibbutz, Mm -hmm. to be members of this community? Mm -hmm. So that's how Friday ends. Now let's talk about how Saturday begins. Yeah. 6 a.m., we're in bed and we hear the whistle of a mortar that is about to land on our neighborhood. People who have heard this noise will recognize it. You're used to it after. (laughs) Then, now we're not excited about that because we've lived in Kibbutz Nachaloz for a while. So, you know, we wake up that morning from the mortar and we're not too worried because this has happened to us over the years. When you come to live in Nachaloz, this is part of your life. Buy into this, this is part of it. Every now and then there's going to be a conflict with Gaza. And rockets and mortars will fall on your neighborhood. There's no Iron Dome in Nachalos. We're too, too close, close to the border. Iron Dome does not cover us. We view ourselves, in a way, as the Iron Dome of Israel mm. by being there. And so what we do, we get out of bed and we run to the safe room. In every home in these communities on the border with Gaza, there's a room that is built of strong concrete. Mm-hmm. And most families... Steel get, door, big thing. We have yeah, one in our home in exactly, Jerusalem, but exactly. uh, yeah, not everybody has one. But yeah, but in our area, you okay. must have it in your house. And most families, that's where you put the kids to sleep at night. Mm-hmm. Because then if there's a rocket right. alarm in the middle of the night... You have to grab them and move them. The parents run to the children yes. and not the other way around. Okay. So this is what happens. We run to the safe room. Our girls are sleeping there and it's okay. You know, there's some bombs falling, there's some noises, but we are fine. We have a very clear set of procedures for what to do when a war begins. Mm -hmm. We pack our bags Mm -hmm. and when there is a 10 minute break from the bombings, and there always is a break because they need to replenish, that's when we shove the girls into the car, two suitcases, and we drive out of the kibbutz. So we're just waiting for it to stop. But this has been a well-rehearsed process. Unfortunately, it's part of our lives. But this time it doesn't stop. It continues, it continues. But there was a, there was a turning point. At 7 a.m., we begin to hear automatic gunfire. At first, it's a little distant, but it, it, you know, it's but you clearly know it's, in our area. Yeah. It's clearly inside Israel. You know, when, when you live in Nachalos, you learn to recognize the noises of war in a very distinct way. You know, when are they bombing us? When are we bombing them? Mm-hmm. And when there's gunfire, you, you learn to realize if it's inside mm-hmm. Gaza or it's inside Israel. It's not normal. We are hearing automatic gunfire on our soil and it's getting closer. In the beginning, I can understand it's in the fields of the kibbutz. So I think to myself, maybe Hamas cell infiltrated and the military is fighting them mm-hmm. outside the kibbutz. But then we hear it inside the kibbutz. And a few minutes later, we hear it right outside our window. Now, you have to understand, Joel, we are in this safe room. We lock the door. We lock. There's a big, you know, iron-made window that we lock. Close the... Completely dark. We don't see anything because the electricity also has fallen. Okay. And let's say if this window is over here and I'm standing next to it, you are the Hamas terrorists outside my home. That's how close it is. And at some point, I'm standing here. And I hear a person shouting in Arabic, and I understand Arabic, so I understand what he's saying, where you are seated. And what he's shouting is tactical 
orders to his people. You go to this house, you go to that house, try to break the door. And... Do you now, have a weapon? No, I don't have a weapon. I was um, raised on the idea that the state of Israel is the safest place in the world for Jewish people. And that in the state of Israel, we trust the government, we trust the military, we trust the police. Even if we didn't vote for uh, the government, we trust the government to protect us. There's a contract between the government. 100%. We give you our sons and daughters to serve in the military. We give you our high tax rates. Yeah. You keep us safe. And there is a special contract for our area, Joel, mm -hmm. because the contract says we chose to live here on the border because the state of Israel believes it's important to have border communities, not just military bases, to have civilian life marking the border, marking a line in the sand. This is where Israel begins and ends. Mm -hmm. And the contract was we help to protect the border, but at a time of need, the government will protect us. Yes. So now I'm in the safe room, in the dark, and I have two young girls that are waking up from the sound of gunfire outside their window. Mm. I'm with my brave wife. Are they wife. screaming? What? No. Okay. no, they're not screaming. They're confused. They look at me and they look at their mom, my wife, Mary, and they ask, can we go outside to play? Mm. They're used to waking they're up innocent. in the morning. Yeah, they're waking up in the morning and going out of the room to the living room to play, to, to eat something. Mm -hmm. And now comes the most difficult moment when we have to tell them, girls, we're really sorry, but first of all, you can't get out of the room right now. We have to stay here. Second, there's not going to be any light except the little light we can get from our cell phones because there is no electricity. Uh, we don't have food for you here. My wife did have the uh, wisdom to bring a lot of water into the safe room when the bombs started falling. So Praise God. We weren't short of water. Okay. But they we're telling them, you know, you can't go out. There's no. And food. you're whispering, right? I mean, this is yes. all of this right. is a very, very relaxed. In the, in total darkness. We're in total darkness. We're speaking to them very quietly and very calmly mm -hmm. because what we don't want them to do is to start Scream. crying or screaming yes. because our house is locked. The shades are down, the windows are shut. Mm -hmm. And we hope that maybe, maybe these terrorists think there's nobody home. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just try to be very, very quiet. Mm -hmm. And we tell the girls, now we have to be quiet. It's dangerous outside. We have to stay in the room. We're together. You know, Abba and Ima are with you. And you can play with the little few toys you have here in the room. You know, the, the dolls that you but check cuddle it, with. Sha, but you have be quiet. to be very, okay. very quiet. And I have to say my two girls were absolute uh, heroines. Mm. And they cooperated completely. Mm. They were silent. They stayed in their God beds. Bless them. And I was afraid that at some point they were going to lose patience. Mm -hmm. Now, as this is help... Because I want to give the audience some context. This goes on for 10 hours? 10 hours. 10 hours. Now, as we are trying to calm them down, the terrorists are shooting into our house. We can hear them shooting ammunition through our... Um, the shades. Through, through the shades and the windows into our living room. We hear them knocking on the door with hammers, mm -hmm. trying to break it. Mm -hmm. Boom. And we're just telling the girls, let's all be quiet. Let's all be calm. And at the same time, you know, we're texting mm -hmm. through our phones to the WhatsApp group of our kibbutz, of our community. And we're saying that terrorists are here. They're trying to break into our home. And we're seeing that everybody's sending these messages. Mm -hmm. So I understand that this is not five lone terrorists who made it through. This is not a cell. This is not a cell. This is an army. We hear people saying they're inside my house. They managed to break into some homes. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are the moments when we begin to think we may not come out of this alive. Your father is uh, a general, uh, yeah. but retired, but like uh, a really, you know. A war hero. A war hero himself. Yeah, a retired war hero. Yeah. So, but he lives significantly north from where you guys are. My parents live in Tel Aviv. Okay. And that's about an hour and 15 minutes away. This is one of the funny things, Joel, that you understand and some of your more ardent viewers, but not everybody, how small Israel is that Tel Aviv with the tech and the nightlife is an hour and 15 minutes from the border with Gaza. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I text my parents. I tell them there are terrorists in, outside the house. They're trying to break in. We're not sure if they are in right. or out at that point because of all the gunfire. 
but even in the sealed room, the mama, the, the safe room, you, you do have um, you do have cell coverage or at Wi-Fi. That, at that point, we do very shortly after we started losing it. Okay. But in the first hour of this okay. siege on our home, we still have so cell connection. You could connection. sort of send SOS I could messages still and send messages and, and talk to my okay. parents. And um, my father says, "We're coming to get you guys." Um, I it sounded to me completely illogical. But I have to tell you, Joel, um, one thing that Miriam and I... Want to meet I, your parents? <laughs> <laughs> my parents are very special people. Amir's parents, Noam and Gali Tibon, recently sat down with Leslie Stahl and her crew from 60 Minutes. At that moment, we knew that we are going there. I took my, my pistol and we went. Noam Tibon is dad, he's grandpa, and he's a big deal retired major general who was the senior commander of the Israeli paratroopers and he led forces in the West Bank and at the border with Lebanon. He and Grandma Ghali jumped in their jeep in Tel Aviv and started heading south to rescue their family. We were in a situation that there is no government, there is no military, only citizens. And so, who else? One thing that Miri and I understood is that we are now asking our daughters to put complete faith in their parents. Mm. We're telling them, girls, you have to be quiet. You have to understand there's not going to be food. There's not going to be light. You're not going to be able to go out and play and you have to trust us that there's no other way and you have to be quiet. And they were putting their faith in us. Mm. And I told myself, if my two young girls, you know, Carmel is only a year and a half mm. If they can put their trust in us right now and listen to us, I must put my faith in my own parents. You know, kabedet avicha vetimecha, right? One of the Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. respect your, your father, father and your mother. I told myself, kabedet avicha vetimecha. If they said they're coming, they're coming. And your father has a lot of experience, so if he's coming, I mean, but he's, but he's 62, right? Does he have a weapon? He has a pistol. Okay. And he's nine coming, millimeter. Yeah, a pistol. Thing, yeah. A pistol that he hasn't used in. in some and, and, but time. the terrorists have AK 47s they, and they have grenades. Uh, rocket grenades. And uh, one of the terrorists outside our house, RPGs. We, we found that only later when everything was over, had an RPG aimed at my neighbor's house. He, he, he was found, you know, I saw his body laying like this with an RPG in it. Just about to shoot. A small group of 10 police officers, not officers, policemen, you know, young policemen. Mm -hmm from a special force of the Israeli border patrol that were stationed inside our kibbutz on that morning for almost accidental reasons. So these 10 guys were stationed in our kibbutz and on that morning, they went out to fight together with a very small group from our kibbutz security team, four guys, one of them, my next door neighbor, mm. died, mm. Ilan Fiorentino, he, he did not come back from the fight. Mm. And so these 14 people are waging now a gunfight against 100 terrorists mm. inside our kibbutz. They're, they're outmanned, they're outgunned. Yes. And, uh, and, there and there's no reinforcements coming. With neighbors dying all around them, terrorists swarming all over the kibbutz, and actively trying to break into their home, Amir and his family are clinging to the hope that Amir's parents are racing from Tel Aviv to rescue them. Uh, my parents, my father is a retired general. My mom is a historian former teacher. Her, exper her expertise is the history of the Holocaust in Romania. Wow. And she... Is she from Romania? Yes. Okay. She had written over the years about what happened, you know, when Jewish people back then had to hide their kids mm. in, right. you know, holes in the ground. Cellars or behind and walls. And in cellars and, and in the sewage. Yeah. And tell their kids, now you have to be quiet mm. so nobody hears us. Mm -hmm. And I know... This is the Anne Frank stories and... And, exactly. other, uh, and I know when my parents are heading from Tel Aviv to our area that she's thinking about this. <laughs> but Amir and his family have no idea the challenges and the threats that Saba and Safta, Grandpa and Grandma, are experiencing on the way. Leslie Stahl of 60 Minutes picks up the story. Gali drove at top speed until they were stopped at checkpoints and told they could go no further. And then we started to talk to the policemen and say, we have to, to go, you mm. must let us go. And they were not willing to do that. So we bypassed them. Through the fields, through we had the, a jeep. Yeah, we had the jeep. And then on the next one, we just, we just drove. 
Uh, what? Yeah, they, they, they stopped that and I say, you know what, we are going. It's our son, it's our granddaughters. You want, you can shoot me. We are going. As the grandparents drew closer to the kibbutz, they couldn't believe what they were seeing. We saw, you don't see nobody. Burning cars, bodies on the road, and then there were a man and a woman running, rushing to us, running. And we stopped, and they said, save us. Save us? Yeah. When they get to, you know, close to Sderot, they see a young couple, about the age of my wife and I, running barefoot on the road, mm. looking completely panicked. Mm. These are two people, a couple, um, Lior and Bar, very brave people who ran away from the massacre at the party oh, the music that festival. took place, the music mm. festival, you know, 15 minutes from our house. Mm. There was a music festival on that weekend. We actually passed by it when we did our trip the, mm. the day before. Mm -hmm. 260 um, people are about slaughtered. Killed, massacre, you know, Point killed. blank range. Yeah. And this couple, very brave, they, you know, I, I talked to them later. They had one thing in mind. They have to get back to their children. They have young kids about mm. the ages of my girls. Mm. The kids were with the grandparents, you know, at home. Okay. They were at the festival. They said, we are getting out of this alive. We're going back to our children. They, first of all, they took their car mm. and they drove like crazy. Their car was fired at. Mm. They get, get out of the car. They start running. Mm. They hid in the woods for a while. Mm. And then they make a, an, you know, desperate run for the road. And they see my parents in their mm. Jeep. My parents stopped the car, they put them in. And after already getting close to our area, my parents decide to go back and take this couple to- You can't take them into harm's way, they need exactly. to get out of they harm's way. They take them to a police checkpoint. Wow, wow, wow. And they bring them to the police checkpoint, turn back again and they drive toward Nachal Oz. Mm. They arrive to a kibbutz called Mefalsim. Mefalsim is 10 minutes from Nachal Oz. It's also a border community, but a little more distant. Okay. And over there, they see a group of soldiers that is waiting for orders from the main command. And what these soldiers don't know is that the headquarters of the Gaza border command have been conquered by the terrorists. The headquarters of the military in the Gaza border area have been conquered by Hamas. So there is no order mm. that is going to arrive, but they are waiting mm. for orders. And it's a tragic situation. People are getting slaughtered mm. and they don't know where to go. Mm -hmm. My father approaches them, he says, I'm going to Nachalos to kill terrorists. Do you want to come with me? Mm -hmm. One soldier, a reserve guy who, who, who came there to fight, says, I know you. He knows my father from, you know, reputation. From the, I'm coming with you. Okay. They leave my mom in a bomb shelter on the road, okay. surrounded by dead bodies and burnt cars. Oh. And they start driving, my father and this soldier, Avi Zafrani is his name. They drive toward Nachalos. My father has his pistol, Avi has a proper military grade weapon. Mm -hmm. They get close to Nachal Oz. Ahead of them on the road, they see a military jeep ambushed. They get out of the car and they join the fight. They see three dead guys over there. Chen Buchris, who was a commander in the special forces, Afik Rosenthal and Gal Yavetz, mm -hmm. three very brave soldiers mm -hmm. who fought like lions at mm -hmm. this ambush. And my father takes the gun of one of them and takes the helmet and joins the, the battle. And they, 62 years old. Yes. They kill the terrorists together with the other soldiers. And now they are five minutes from our house. But again, they have to turn back mm. because there are three wounded soldiers mm. from the special unit lying there on the ground, losing blood. Mm. So my father and Avi, this soldier, they put the wounded guys on his car and they drive back to Kibbutz Mefalsim to the bomb shelter where my mom is waiting. And then my parents split. My father tells my, my mom, okay, you take them to the hospital. Okay. So my mom now in her car with three wounded soldiers is rushing to the hospital on a road filled with dead bodies and mm. burnt cars and scenes of hell. And she's taking them to hospital and all of them what a hero. are alive. Yeah. Wow. They made it to the hospital, they got treatment. Wow, wow. They called my parents a few days later, they're, they're with us. And my father is now stuck. He needs to get to Nachalos. He does, he, does he have a vehicle? No, my mom took the car. And, he and needs, you're in the darkness with we're the girls. We have so. no idea any of this is right, happening. Right. My father is waiting to find a way to get to Nachalos. He promised my mom, I'm going to get to Nachalos. Mm -hmm. And then an angel arrives, Israel Ziv. Israel Ziv is a retired military general like my father. He's older. I think he's 66 or 67. Okay. Wow. Old paratroopers guy. Mm -hmm. Got up that morning, 
took his pistol, like my dad, drove down south and looked for ways to kill terrorists and save people. My father tells him, Israel, I need your help. Take me to Nachal Oz. Mm. And Israel says, okay, let's do it. So these two <laughs> grandfathers <laughs> are now driving in Israel's car. Now it's not, it's not a, an armored vehicle, Joe. Right, it's, right. it's a car like people, you know, take when they go to work on the New Jersey Turnpike in the morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They start driving on the same road where half an hour earlier there was an ambush by Hamas. Uh, my father has a military grade weapon that he took from Chen Buchris, the brave officer who was killed in the ambush. Israel has a pistol. Okay. They're driving on the road. They get to the entrance to the kibbutz and they see two groups of soldiers. One of them is Maglan, the same special forces unit that earlier in the morning tried to break the road. Okay. The other is paratroopers. Okay. And there is a fork in the road. The paratroopers go to a military base next to us where there was a very, very terrible massacre that morning. And the Maglan people go into our kibbutz to join the brave fighters from the border patrol who have been holding desperately mm. since the morning. Mm. And at this point, you have to How many hours has gone by at this point? Seven. Seven, seven, hours. Hour, seven hours. We're in the dark. We have no idea any of this is happening. We have no cell phone at this point. You have no air conditioning. Nothing. No air, you know. no food, and no noises of gunfire all the time. And it's hot. It's hot. The girls are hungry, and they're very brave. I don't know how they held up. I have a lot of black holes in my memory, but they held up beautifully. My father um, tells, you know, this group of soldiers from Maglan, my, my son lives here. I know every alley in this kibbutz because he comes once a week to be babysitter. L let me join you. And they, they're a bit shocked that this, you know, general they've seen in the past on television is there, but their commander, a young officer, okay, come with us. They joined these brave soldiers from the border patrol and the kibbutz security team. And it's important to understand, Joel, at this point, my neighbor, the head of the kibbutz security is dead. Mm. The commander of the border patrol group is dead. Mm. And there are wounded in both groups, in both the border patrol and the security team of the kibbutz, there are several wounded guys. Mm. They are pretty desperate. Mm -hmm. And so this reinforcement- you, in, a, in, a, in a classic war situ zone situation, you'd call these, this combat ineffective, right? You've got too many casualties to move forward. They, 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 how do you save their lives, but also save everybody else's lives? The special forces arrived, I think at the last moment, these guys could still fight. Mm. And this reinforcement was very important for them. Mm. And they were absolute heroes, absolute heroes, what they did that morning. So now there's a bigger force. And um, my father gives them a little briefing on how you do home to home cleansing in an urban environment. Because it's a very important to, you know, you go from house to house, you kill any terrorists you see, and you have to watch your back. Right. That somebody isn't hiding in right, a room right, that you right. missed and will come back and shoot you from behind. Right. And they start doing it. They start going from home to home, you know, killing the terrorists that are still running around, mm -hmm. knocking on people's safe rooms, telling them, the military is here. You're safe now. Mm -hmm. And you keep going. And again, we don't know any of this is happening, but we start hearing more and more gunfire, mm -hmm. and it's getting closer. So we start you're, you're starting to think that the tide might be turning? I know. I tell Miri, my father is here. <laughs> she said, how do you know? I said, you hear the gunfire? He's in the kibbutz. They start moving from home to home. And we start hearing some yelling in Hebrew. All day morning, we only <laughs> heard yelling in Arabic. And around 4 p.m., now we've been in the safe room for 10 hours. We hear this bang on the window of the safe room and we hear my father's voice from outside. And Galia, my, my older daughter, three and a half years old, she said, Saba Egia. Grandfather. Grandfather, because we kept telling them, you know, in the last two hours in the safe room were the most difficult, Joel, because they had fallen asleep and we were sure that by the time they wake up, we will have some clarity. The military they actually were, fell asleep. They fell asleep. It's like the they fell spirit of God so came at, down at some and said, Listen, they just were go just to sleep. Tired and hungry, yeah, and they fell yeah. asleep. Oh my God! They slept together in the same bed, you know, almost oh. hugging each other. Oh. And when they woke up, they really were about to lose it because the nightmare had gone on for so long. Yeah, yeah. And that's when we told them, Saba Baderch, if we mm. just stay quiet for a little He's longer, on He's on the way. Saba will come and open yeah. the door. And this is the only thing that held them composed: the hope that their grandfather is going to come. So when we hear him, and, and she said, you know, Saba we all just started crying. Um, we went out the room for the first time in 10 hours. We opened the door to the house. My father came in, the soldiers came in. We gave them 
all the food we had in the house. <laughs> we brought food to the girls. You said your 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 home became the a command center for the rest of the operations. Now there were several scenes, Joel, that I will never forget until the day I die. First of all, the the girls were very happy to see their grandfather, yes. and you know he was wearing you know clothes that were stained with blood. We understand he's been through something. He's been in, in actual in, combat. In, in combat, and my younger daughter Carmel. Uh, Miri takes her in her hands to see, you know, grandfather and the soldiers. And she looks at one of the soldiers, armed from, you know, mm -hmm. top to bottom. He's actually in a full combat. Helmet, yeah. gun, you know, Black ammunition. Yeah. She looks at him, but he has this, you know, young, nice face. And she says, Zayeled, it's a boy. Oh. It's a child. And we just started crying. And, you know, she was right. This is a child, an 18, you know, 19 year old, maybe soldier mm -hmm. who came to save us. Mm -hmm. And they started bringing people into our home, okay. neighbors that couldn't stay in their own homes. Okay. For example, an old man who his wife had been murdered. Mm. He was injured. He was staying alone in the safe mm. for hours. Mm. You know, they brought him to our house. Mm. The neighbors across from us, um, the RPG was aimed at their home. Mm. So it was dangerous for them to stay inside the house. So they, you know, Pretty soon we have 40 people in oh our house. Wow, wow. And what a what a total reversal of completely from being alone and disconnected from the world. Suddenly the electricity comes back. There's 40 <laughs> people in our house, 12 children, mm. you know, and there's still bombs falling and, and, mm. and gunfire. But we feel safe. You know, one of the neighbors puts on this huge, you know, pasta uh, pot <laughs> for all the kids. Um, and people are coming in and out, bringing their dogs. It's it, it's crazy. But at the same time, it was also a very, very sad situation because we yes. start understanding what had happened. You know, this person is dead and this person is missing and this person is injured and mm. kids are These asking... These are your friends. These are your neighbors. Yeah, my, you know, my next door neighbor, Ilan, the security coordinator who died, his wife is asking anybody who comes into the house, she's with us now, have you seen my husband? And, and people, you know, they tell her, I haven't seen him since the morning. I don't know what happened to him. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to comfort her and to occupy her girls. She has three young girls. One of them goes to kindergarten with my Galia. Mm -hmm. She just keeps asking people, have you seen him? <sighs> About 11.30 p.m., uh, a bus arrived to take all of us out of the kibbutz. And we haven't been back since then. We are now being hosted by this community where we are making this interview, uh, Kibbutz Mishmara Emek in North Central Israel. I want to close with this question and feel free to say you don't want to answer it. Are you a religious person? Um, how are you processing this from just the perspective of, I, I, I honestly, I, I've known you for a long time, but I've never asked you, you know, you, I'm an evangelical, a Jewish evangelical, uh, which I know sounds strange to you, but, um, how are you processing this spiritually? Is that an element for you and your family, Miri, and, um, and, and your parents? I don't know, but yeah. how do you see this? I'm not religious in the practicing manner, but I do believe in God. And I'm having a lot of thoughts right now about what happened because I believe we had a miracle. Mm. It's a miracle that we're alive. Yeah. So many things have gone the other way. And Joel, a few days ago, my grandmother passed away. Mm. She was 94. Oh, goodness. She fought in the War of Independence <laughs> in 1948. And it was sad mm. to lose her. She died in her sleep, mm. peacefully. Mm. And I just thought... Once She's, but she died knowing that you were miraculously yes. saved. And this is what I wanted to say. Mm. I wanted to thank God. The, and not just God alone, but also the s people who fought for us on that day. The border police guys the security team in the kibbutz, the special forces guys, my father, my mother, my wife and my daughters, everybody. And also to thank God that we went to her funeral last Friday and not the other way around. Mm. It wasn't that far from the roles being switched. Yeah. And I want to thank God that the last thing that she went through in her life was hearing the story of how her son saved her grandson and great-granddaughters and not having to come to her funeral. That 
I want to thank God for that. I know not everybody in Israel is, a, is even a Bible reader, much less a Bible believer. I'm, I'm a Bible reader. And I, yeah. I want to say something about yeah, the miracles, please. Joel. And this is the last thing I'm going to say. Okay. There is a story in the Bible about how the Israelites got out of Egypt mm. and the dogs did not bark. Mm. You remember this? Kelev lo yecheratz leshono. You know, our dog on that day did not bark. We keep talking about the girls, that they yeah. didn't cry. But the dog did not bark. That's, that, it should be the complete opposite. He should have been barking like crazy. Yeah. And then the tourists would have said, okay, there's probably people in this house. Right. Let's do everything we can to break in. He was completely silent. And my mother said, this is like the story in the Bible. Kelev bal yecheratz leshono. Who knows, Joel? Yeah. Who knows? Thank you. Amir, I, 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 you're a friend already. But I'm very grateful that you would sit down with, it, with the Rosenberg Report, TBN audience, and share with evangelicals the miracle that you and your own family experienced and that your parents and your friend were, were a part of. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. And there's one more miracle we're expecting. We're going home at some point. It will take some time. And I know that people who support and love the state of Israel in the United States and around the world will help us rebuild our community. Yes. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to them today. Thank you. Bless you. I'm so grateful. Okay. What a remarkable story. And what an honor to be able to bring it to you. Yes, Israelis are in our darkest hour since 1948. But even though Satan hates us and wants to kill us and all Jewish people, the God of Israel has not abandoned us. He's still doing miracles. He's still determined to get our attention as individuals and as a nation to draw us to himself, his love, his word, and his enduring promises. So please don't stop praying for us here in Israel, and of course for our neighbors and our enemies. Please keep praying especially for people like my friend Amir Tibon and his extraordinary family.